a very warm welcome to kitab e club live so uh, here we are at kitab e club with another amazing author interaction so the book that uh, we are going to talk about is uh, the yoga sutras for children by rupa pai and uh, i'll just give you a brief idea of who the author is so uh, she's a writer columnist and a speaker and she's well known for her uh, for her book the geeta for children and uh, she has uh, she has a ted talk about the book and uh, which which has received over 2 million views so let us um, welcome our author for so i'll just send her a request and she's joining us Okay, so the author is here with us. Hi, Rupa. Hi, hi. I'm just coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, hello, and a very warm welcome. Thank you. Namaste. Very happy to be here. <laughs> we are we are really happy to host you. Thank you. And uh, so here's the book. the yoga sutras for children so actually uh, while i was going through the book while i was reading the book it was very very insightful see the number of tabs that i have they are a testimony to all the amazing things i have read in the book and i really loved them so um, instead of the yoga sutras for children i feel it should be the yoga sutras for everyone <laughs> because actually we as adults need to read and you know need to read this more often so that you yeah. know we in we imbibe it and when we imbibe it the children see us and they follow <laughs> absolutely absolutely i have been told this ever since the geeta for children came out 8 years ago that why did you call it for children it's for everyone and uh, you know by calling it for children it gets lost in the children's department of the bookstore and we don't get to spot it and it's really meant for everyone and then you know there was this elderly gentleman an old friend of the family who enjoyed the geeta for children so much that he translated it into kannada which is my mother tongue which of my without even you know within 15 days of the book being out he had translated the entire thing into kannada because he found it so beautiful and when i told him that you know uncle they are saying people are saying that it should not be called for children he said no i think it's the perfect name because we are all children where the geeta is concerned wow and i'd like that is the same thing with the yoga sutras we are all children where the sutras are concerned so i think yeah you know, it's absolutely so you know uh, when i first picked up the book uh, reading the name the title the yoga sutras so the first thing which comes to our mind is yoga asanas and we feel like oh how will a book tell me about the asanas and the yoga so can you throw yes. some light on what doesn't have any pictures so i mean not photographs so how, yeah 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 like what yoga sutras are what are they yeah the thing is while the the other topics that i have tackled in this landscape before whether it's the geeta or the vedas and upanishads for children those are familiar yeah. to people they may not know exactly what the upanishads are or what the names of the upanishads or what stories each upanishad contains uh, but they will know the names of the four vedas at least and the geeta is of course very very popular whether however much you know of it or however little you know of it you definitely know of its existence you know that it's part of the mahabharata you know that it's a conversation between arjuna and krishna and that much at least everybody knows True. but the yoga sutras not so popular you know uh, very few people know very much about it i think apart from what we studied in high school uh, social studies somewhere you know while doing vedic civilization or something or you know puranic civilization we have studied that there was a book there was a text called the yoga, yoga sutras written by a patanjali you know that 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 is the extent of our knowledge about it if you go to a yoga class in which the teacher is quite invested in the sutras also apart from just the asanas then she or he will probably tell you a little bit about the sutras but otherwise we don't know much about it and i myself wasn't aware very much about it uh um, so i think uh, you know what happened was when when covid started uh when the lockdowns began all of us were you know we 
and in the beginning everyone was very happy now i can do what i really want to do and i have the time and things like that and so one i decided to follow one of my bucket list items for which had been there for at least for 8 years which was to learn sanskrit i had never learned sanskrit in school and i had already written these books the gita for children the vedas upanishads for children by going through uh, commentaries and translations in english uh, i understood a little sanskrit because my mother tongue kannada is quite sanskritized so many of the nouns and everything i could understand but not the grammar and stuff i didn't know so i said okay this is a good opportunity let me start learning sanskrit online and my sanskrit teacher uh, was connected to an organization called indika yoga which used to organize lectures and uh, about various aspects of indian knowledge systems so mm-hmm. one day she invited us all to attend this online lecture by a dr vinay chandra banavati who is a yoga scholar and a sanskrit scholar of course and uh, indian psychology yoga is considered indian psychology actually mm-hmm. you know and uh, so i said okay let me attend this sounds interesting and my mind was blown the way he explained what the yoga sutras were and i said you know i felt that sort of familiar tingle that i usually feel when i feel like oh my god i should write a book about for kids about this you know, it seems like something that kids should know mm-hmm. because what the yoga sutras are really about is mind control it teaches you how to be a mind control ninja and uh, basically what patanjali tells us in the very first it's a very succinct text there are only 195 196 sutras yeah uh, depending on whom you ask people will say 195 some people say 196 and they're all very short mm. you know very very succinct so almost very difficult to understand if you just read the sutras themselves but if you read them along with the commentary which you must because even the original patanjali sutras have never been found the text of those but we know of them because of commentaries by people who came after so uh, in the first four uh, sutras itself patanjali tells us everything we need to know it's that compact so the first sutra is uh, atha yoga anushasanam which is now for the teachings of yoga and then the next line is a very definition of yoga which is the definition of patanjali's yoga there are other kinds of yoga but this particular yoga is defined as yoga's chitta vritti nirodha which is the stilling of the churnings of the chitta okay that that's what it is and that is what one wants to achieve and then you might ask why why should you still your mind what's the point i mean we all know the answer to that we know how calm and good we feel when our mind is still and not churning with emotions and thoughts you know we know that suppose we go to a beautiful place in nature somewhere and we just you know enjoying the beauty of it and your mind is still or if you're deeply do into focused on something you're doing maybe it's a piece of music you're listening to maybe it's a book you're reading when you're deeply into that you understand you realize how much at peace you are how much you when your mind your mind is still it's focused laser focused on something so he says why you should still the mind the reason why you should still the mind is because if you don't you will never know who you really are he says only tada drashta swarupe vasanam only when your mind is still you see yourself as you truly are otherwise you see yourself only as the churnings of your mind so he says is uh, a uh, you know vritti swarupyam itaratra if you don't otherwise if you don't still your mind you see yourself as the churnings of your mind and that identification of yourself as your thoughts as your body as your emotions that is what causes stress in our minds that's what causes chaos confusion unhappiness fear everything because if we can see ourselves as we truly are we are neither the body nor the mind nor the emotions if we can step back and look at ourselves like that we can live fearlessly because we know then that nothing can harm us but to be able so imagine your mind or your chitta as a lake and if the lake is constantly being roiled by the mud from below being churned then obviously it doesn't reflect what is around it but imagine if the lake is really still then you can't even tell which is the outside and which is the inside right uh, in those the calendar pictures of switzerland and things like that you see how it's a still mountain lake 
the exact every leaf on every tree is reflected in the lake and that is what happens to us when we can make our minds still so the whole yoga sutras is like a practical workbook to accompany the theory lessons of the vedas the upanishads and the gita which tell us how, not only that we are not our body and mind our emotions but how to experience it for ourselves by giving us practical tips of how to get there so it's a workbook and that is what drew me to it that it's not just okay understand 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 okay understood but how do i get there exactly you know, yeah. so this is what patanjali helps with Yeah. Wonderful! You've explained it so beautifully. And since you spoke about vritti watching, that's my next question to you. That uh, vritti watching, when I it it was something that affected me a lot when I was reading the book, and I really loved that part. I read it twice. I read it to my sons also, and and because. the analogy the analogy that you did over there with uh, those emo- emojis that was amazing so how did that idea come to your mind and how do you relate it to the vritti watching concept yeah uh, no i i don't know it just came to me because of maybe i had just received one of those whatsapp forwards <laughs> and it was a cool thing even the whatsapp forward it said look at your emoji list when you click on the emojis that you normally use and look at the last five emojis you have used yeah. which is usually the most commonly used the ones you most commonly use and that will tell you about your state of mind and your uh, you know what kind what kind of conversations you have been having the kind of people you have been having the conversations with because if it's mostly ha ha you know that lol rofl emoji then you know that you probably been having happy conversations with someone or you know you've been laughing a lot and enjoying yourself but if it's like you know the roll up eyes emoji then obviously <laughs> you've been you know like oh my god come on stop it you know that kind of thing or if you have a um a wink emoji then you know what it is if you have a red angry emoji you know what it is if you have a namaste emoji whatever you know so you know the kind of conversations and the kinds of people you've been having it with but i felt it cool it's quite a cool psychological exercise but it may not be authentic because so many times we put in emojis that we don't really mean yeah. just to a conversation or to show you know support for something but you're not really meaning it so i said what if we do as patanjali said instead and mm. what our rittis actually what we are let us watch rittis is like the activities or the movements of the mind so let us watch it ourselves and that that will be authentic instead of depending on some whatsapp emoji to tell us why don't we so that's why i titled that section i'd be looking for a new hobby why don't you try vritti watching <laughs> yes. for a while watch the thoughts come and go because meditation is not really about a stilling of the thoughts as much as it is removing yourself taking a step back from your thoughts and watching them and when you and i have given that example somebody else another another 20 year old who read it said oh i love that secret too you know <laughs> about don't get on those vritti trains uh, so in that i have said about how these vrittis or these emotions are like and thoughts are like trains that come into the platform of your mind and you are so enamored by that thought you're so attracted by the thought that you either you get on to that train and then it takes you somewhere that you didn't want to be at you're too so far away from where you began and then there's chaos as you try to find your way back to that state of mind that you were in when you started so instead of that just watch that train let it come resist the urge to get on to that train resist that means resist the urge to react to that thought because that's what it's beating you come on come on react to me and then it will take you away somewhere instead just watch it and say no no you can't tempt me i'm not getting on that on that train and sooner or later that train will leave when it's in the station you feel my god if i don't get on to it i will miss it and then what will happen so you feel you have to react don't and when you see that it goes away you realize that everything is so transient so temporary all these emotions there's no need to get so attached to them so that that that's what the with a train thing is the train uh, analogy and the um emoji you know analogy just learn to watch your thoughts and you that's a great learning in itself about yourself because the yoga sutras are all about dhyana yoga dhyana yoga is self reflection so it's only about understanding your own true nature that is the purpose of it and if you don't 
spend time with yourself and your thoughts how can you get your mind to be still so it's all about that that's true i'll just share something very interesting that happened so when i was reading that part vritti watching i really loved it and you know i shared it as a story that uh, yeah. such a small thing that we do but it could be so meaningful so a lot of my friends uh, you know messaged me with five of their emojis that they were actually using and uh, you know they could relate to it so yeah. that was something which was so i mean when i read the book this happened and also when i after reading this uh, all about this vritti watching so it happens with all of us that you know a lot of thoughts keep coming to our minds on a daily basis whatever we are doing so that happened with me i had some thoughts and they kept coming and i thought wait vritti watching is what i have to do and i i just you know those thoughts just i did not climb on that train actually so yeah it it affected me in that way so i think oh, that that it was so impactful that you even tried it out immediately and it worked because i did the same while i was writing the book and also so yeah so you know that that's how effective especially that part was i mean there are obviously a lot of them a lot of things to learn but yes that was something which really really affected me so uh, moving on uh, there's a lot of humor in the book which you know for such a heavy topic as yoga sutras and a lot of humor in it so it makes it very relatable how do you inculcate all that humor uh, in the books um I don't know I think that is the way I view the world in general that uh, I don't take myself too seriously I don't take the world too seriously so uh, and I also am very conscious of the fact I think or maybe I'm good at being a children's writer because of how I view the world I don't know which came first but I'm always uh, aware of the fact that I'm writing for young people mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't matter whether the young or old I think humor is a great device to use while writing and for me it's i mean i think i'm lucky that it comes quite naturally i have that kind of uh, that's the way i view uh, things in general but also because you know we we all talk about how short the attention span of young people is today they are the instagram and we are on instagram live right now <laughs> but you know they <laughs> they are always doing this infinite scroll and uh, you yeah. know they they, they can watch anything you know this is the new wisdom that people tell us don't make a reel more than 30 seconds nobody has the patience to watch it as and the yoga sutras is the exact opposite it's asking you to focus on something for a long time not to let those thoughts come and go like that but to stay with one thought for a long time uh and i think when you're especially when you're giving this kind of philosophy and you don't want to be preachy and you want to I want young people to at least pay you a bit of heed you have to bring in some lightness into it uh and i think that's why i do it and uh, and in fact um patanjali himself because the i mean the gita is a beautiful text right it's it's so full of emotion it's it's dripping with bhakti rasa you know and it's got that great friendship between these two so it's a very heartwarming text to write about to write about or retell but patanjali is very straightforward boss this is it you know and this is what i'm saying you you please do it and he keeps saying that there's no exceptions and no excuses you have to do it this way or you'll never get anywhere so when it's that kind of a rigorous kind of instruction there is more need to make it simpler and gentler for people to because there's great wisdom in it but if you say it in that way It, it's not going to appeal yeah but i realized as i was reading the yoga sutras that even patanjali had his soft side why he says that tapah swadhyaya you know you have to be great great discipline tapas like you know you have to be that dedicated and that discipline then he says swadhyaya self reflection this is really important but he also leaves that with saying ishvara pranidhana he says okay okay i know this is all hard so maybe at some point if you can submit to the will of the universe if you can ask for grace that will make your life a little easier so i thought he was the best kind of teacher showing tough love at one time but also giving you tips and hacks as to how to make the journey easier so <laughs> i thought he would connect well with the 21st century 
teenager or with anybody who is of that age who is resistant to authority and instruction but if the teacher sounds somewhat cool and somewhat sweet you're more willing to listen you know so that's why i, I made patanjali into that kind of figure in the book he has his direct conversations with the readers also with young readers yeah. uh, so that those parts are also there yeah so i think that's how i did it yeah and those conversations were very interesting to read so kind of you know summarized what we had just read and it was a conversation based on that so yeah that was very interesting i would also like to appreciate the creation the cover page of the book it's beautifully done by sayan mukherjee and look at this illustration this was my favorite it was so calming it was so beautiful that you know i i could just see it and just look at it for for you know hours together because it just gives a sense of calm this calm. one especially i know yeah 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 it is and yeah. you can see the storm around but you are you are the calm center of the storm you are not the storm that is the whole teaching you are not all this tamasha that's going on around you you think you are yeah. but you're not just pull yourself a little back and you'll realize that at the center of any hurricane at the center of any tornado the earthquakes epicenter those are the calmest parts everything else is swirling around but at the center right. of the storm it's the quietest and that's what you are actually you're the center of the storm so yeah i think that illustration yeah. depicts that beautifully you're right yeah <laughs> so uh, now are uh, you mostly written books pertaining to all the you know old scriptures like the gita the upanishads and uh, so like why why do you choose these topics and uh, i mean like and you know so like why why is it that only these topics specially hmm actually that, that that's not true in the sense i've written about a bunch of other stuff i've written a book on economics for children i've written yeah. a book on the history of medicine for children i've written a whole eight part fantasy adventure series for children called tara knots i've done a book on life skills uh, i've done a book on popular science so there, there are uh, and also i've done milin soman's uh, you know biography uh, autobiography i've done it with him so i've done and one book most recent book was on kabban park in bangalore which is a heritage 150 year old park in bangalore so but i have many interests and there's history and math and all the rest of it but yes you are right that i usually do not do more than one book in the same kind of subject but when it comes to indian uh, ancient indian texts i have this is my third okay which is surprising but 8 years ago or 9 years ago if you had told me that i would be writing even one i would have really laughed very loudly and said absolutely no chance because <laughs> because you know i don't even know sanskrit how and i while i was deeply i have always been deeply interested in indian mythology i haven't really engaged i hadn't really engaged in indian scripture or uh, the ancient texts so much you know i love mythology but you know, but not but it was my editor at hashet her name is vatsala kaul banji for some reason she decided that i should do a version of the bhagavad gita for children and for 6 months i resisted staunchly i said absolutely not i am not that kind of author i write cool books for children i don't write those kinds of books all this you know i i was i was in that camp and i said no 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 and i'm sure it's going to be some kind of patriarchal book it may be casteist it may be you know and i'm not going to whitewash all that for children all, all this drama i did and then she asked me have you read it have you ever actually read the gita and i said well no but i mean i know what it's about she said no that's not fair to the gita i think you should read it once in its entirety with commentary and everything and then at the end of it if you say no it's not for children or whatever you want to say or i don't want to write it for these these reasons i'll i'll be okay with it i think i was partly i was hugely intimidated by the gita because while somebody like rick riordan who writes the percy jackson series you know about the greek gods and things he can yeah. write whatever he likes about the greek gods because nobody worships those gods anymore they are really truly part of mythology but in our culture the gita is still a living breathing text it's vibrantly alive and people are very very attached to it so if i wrote something in a way that you know offended people or people felt hurt by it then you know 
it would I, I felt I might do that because I, I don't know enough about it and I don't know Sanskrit and things like that. But when I started reading the text with commentary, I found that like all Indian texts, it just opened itself to me. It said, you interpret it as, as you like, because that's what the Gita is and that's what the whole teaching about ancient Indian texts is, that it's yours. You see it as you want, because it depends on your samskaras, what your life experience is, what you have brought into this lifetime from other lifetimes, if we believe that in reincarnation and all the rest of it. So how a text affects you depends on who you are. There is no, this is the right way to interpret it. You interpret it according to what you feel. So it gave me the freedom to do that. And then I said, my God, by the time I finished the second chapter, I was like, why haven't I read this text before? And how wonderful my life would have been if I had read it earlier. And of course, children should know about this. And the thing with these ancient Indian texts are that once you enter one through one portal, others keep popping up. They keep opening up to you. And you get so curious, my God, what are the riches there? I wonder what riches are there. And you get so addicted to this. Because after the Gita for Children came out, my editor immediately said, oh, it's been well received. Come on now, you should write the Vedas and Upanishads. And once again, I said, no. I'm not going to be typecast. The Gita was very special. Let that be. But now I want to write about other stuff. And because she was so wise, I call her my Krishna, uh, Vatsala, my editor, because she, she knows me better than I know myself, I think. So she said, okay, you go and do other books, whatever you want to do. Almost as if she was sure I would come back. And I did a bunch of other books. But at the end of it, the pull of the ancient text was so strong that you know, the Gita is a distillation of the wisdoms of the Upanishads. And I, it began to bother me. I wonder what the Upanishads said. I wonder what Vedavyasa left out while condensing mm. stuff for the Gita. What did he talk about? And I wanted to see what the origin texts were. So I said, okay, I think now I'm ready to do the Vedas and Upanishads. So she said, please come <laughs> back, do it. And after that had happened, now I'm like, whenever a text suggests itself to me, whenever some fascination happens, I will do it. And that's how the Yoga Sutras came about. Wonderful. That's, you know, it's it's so nice to know about your journey and how it all happened. And Geet, the, I mean, the Gita for Children is so, so popular. And uh, I think it is an award-winning book as well. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, okay. So now I've written about Gita. There has been Vedas and Upanishads, now Yoga Sutra. So what's going to be next? I have to wait for that thing to happen again. I have no idea. I don't plan beforehand. I had never thought even while writing the Gita that there would be two more. And now I feel like three is a nice round number. I always feel that at the end of the day. I said, Gita finished, Vedas finished. Now that's all. What else is there? You know, I've done. Then suddenly <laughs> Yoga Sutras came up from something. So just now I'm feeling three is a good number. There are many threes in Indian uh, thinking and philosophy. Three is a nice number the trinity and the trilogy, whatever you want to call it. So I'm like, maybe that's enough. Maybe I should think about something else. But who knows? You know, something will pop yeah. up from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, hoping that something really pops up from somewhere and get to read more from you. And of course, uh, reading about these old scriptures in a new way is really insightful, really wonderful. And we all books so yeah it was wonderful talking to you rupa and uh, knowing about uh, i was touched by your uh, story because you said non-fiction is not my jam it's not a thing i enjoy very much but i actually read this book and i finished it and i enjoyed it so that was like a huge compliment for me uh, thank you so much and a compliment to of course maharishi p i call him maharishi p yeah <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, thank you so much. And it's a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.